Are you sick of yoga pants? <laughs> Can we do a whole season? All right. On my frustration with yoga pants. Or I, I want to do one. The con, the the sign of the conflict of our culture right now, especially like in you know rad trad movements and stuff, is or in college campuses. It's like we we live in a time where someone can be wearing a chapel veil and yoga pants at the same time. <laughs> Like, that's true. how you know we don't know. know what we're doing. I know we don't, yeah, we're like a schizophrenic world. Can we just hit play and just start going? Absolutely. Okay. Recording. This is the best podcast, yeah. man. You're doing it now. So we'll just, all right, so we'll just, you don't even have to do an intro. Just, <laughs> that's right. We've already, the intro was the last one. So, so fish don't know they're in water. So that, that, rem, and I said, you know, I've caught the same stupid fish multiple times. How do you know it's the same fish? Because so, you you can you throw it away, like you throw it back. It's got you, it's got a nasty hole, you know, through its mouth because you caught it. Okay, you throw okay. it back in. Ten minutes later, you catch the same damn fish. So they don't. Well, that doesn't mean they don't know they're in water. They just don't know. Well, that's not, true. I'm just saying they're really stupid. Okay. But it reminds me of little boys that do the same thing over and over again. Right. Like you have a little kid who jumps <laughs> off the countertop, you know, trying to like fly with a blanket as if it's a cape. Right. He, you know, he, 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 he bangs himself up. He hurts like hell and he screams. Five minutes later, he does it he again. He does it again. My That's daughters right. don't do that. Yeah. They learn yeah, we had very my, quickly. We, we had five boys in a row. Then we had a girl. And we were at the dinner table one day and I realized, man, everything is different with her. Everything is because we had five. So five boys in a row was, that was a decade of boys. They're about every two years. We had a decade of savagery. <laughs> and and we're sitting at the table and she's sitting next to me because like in our family when the baby kind of goes from like mom and then when she's done with the baby at the table it goes all the way to the other end of the table next to me so like it's kind of like this graduating thing and so she's next to me first time and she takes a bite of food and gets some food on her face and then she picks up a, oh, napkin, a napkin and wipes it off and I like stopped I'm like family look <laughs> Look at what just happened. But then my son, so the, the next one up from her, like you said, doing the same thing every time. You would think that a child putting their shoes on, 50% of the time they would be done correctly. And so how do they get it wrong 90% of the time? It's 90% of the time he's wrong. And uh, But in his defense. Do your kids, put, do your kids put underwear on backwards? Underwear. Because they, Why are they putting underwear on? <laughs> what, yeah, what, underwear what was, am I talking about? You needed yeah. underwear back in the day because <laughs> this is my defense of children – Free, free balling is the word. Uh, Commando. Or, or Commando. In, uh, in Louisiana, they call it shrimping. <laughs> shrimping. <laughs> okay. A long time ago, you didn't wash your pants frequently, right? right? So you wanted to have a, you know, so you would just wash your underwear. So I'm like, my little Katie's like, they're, my, my wife, they're not wearing underwear. I'm like, oh, whatever. You're going to wash the pants anyway. Like, yeah. it's going to be. Anyway, But no. they pick up the underwear. They look at the front of it, and then they put it on. Yeah. That's right. I can't. I say t- goes back. Tag in the back. Tag in the back. Tag in the back. Tag in the back. It doesn't. All right. So my. But my, no, I've wondered about how does the shoes end up on the wrong feet like ninety percent of the time. Yeah. No, I don't know. You know, maybe the, it's because what you said about fish. Fish are stupid. You say they are children. Stupid. It's children are stupid. <laughs> so, uh, Aquinas says they are born in sin and ignorance, not stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a much better way to say we need it. The prayer I'm be- going to tell them the that. prayer before study. We we we're praying as a family. We're having these family conversations, and, which we should talk about. All right. Um, and we pr- I say, see, children. Aquinas said you were born in sin and ignorance. Definitely. That's why we need He's each right. other. Yeah. He's right. But I mean, what do you mean? They're inexperienced is what he means. But so there. my, and speaking of sin, <laughs> my greatest time frame of sin every week is probably the 20 minutes prior to getting in the church Sunday morning, get, getting in the car to go to church Sunday morning because I can't find the damn shoes. Yeah. And yeah. somehow or another. You can find five different shoes without a pair? Yeah. Does that happen to you? Yeah. All the time. Wait, wait. But, didn't you write this well-ordered family? I'm here to learn from yeah, you. Yeah. My next book is called The Art of Hypocrisy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's my true expertise is hypocrisy. Yeah. But I want to understand how it is that finding the kids' shoes – for church on Sunday has been delegated to me. This is mm. a real problem. And you need to my, order your home. That's I a, think it's grounds for an annulment. <laughs> I no. I just. I well. I have it. It's gotten great for us. The kids have gotten older, so they're getting themselves ready. <clears throat> I have removed. So this is how we have ordered this system. I have removed their church clothes from their possession, and they're all oh, smart. The jackets are all hanging up, yeah. like in the laundry room. No, that's, yeah, that's right. But. Shoes. They wear them once a week, right? Because we're on the farm. And they have their Sunday mass shoes. Yeah, yeah. And 
why are they missing every week? How, uh-huh. how, and what's the younger ones? You got yeah. So we try we try to bring order and structure into that. We've tried the cubby system and like keep the little church shoes in your cubbies and. And just it breaks down. You have to reinvent that system. Everything. No, we but, to, okay, that's good. No, we actually have to settle this. My wife recently, she doesn't have a honey do list. She says it has a honey do you love me list. It's on the refrigerator. Hmm. And it's because I would go, uh, you know, the reason we needed this list in our communication is because I'm working all day. I'm doing stuff. I'm around the house. I'm around the farm. I'm like, I'm active. And then I'm sensing she's disappointed. She's like, well, you know, I needed, I needed a lot of things done. I'm like, did you see how much I got done today? And I was getting done what I think is the more important things, the necessary things, the, the you know, whatever. You're using the, the Stephen Covey quadrants or oh, yeah. whatever you're... Yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah, urgent, not important, all that stuff. That's in here, by the way. Is it? Yes, it is. It's called the Family Focus Box, and it's how to... Org- Wait, hold on. We're still talking about my system here. Sorry. So the, the <laughs> list, the reason the list was helpful is because I can look at it, and I told her, I am doing this to make you happy. Like, this is for your psychological and emotional happiness. It's not because I think this should be done. But I'm, I knock those things off the list, and it's a little. It's, but it's everything from what's dishwasher solution to but but uh, shoe system is on the list, and I'm just leaving it there. I'm like, I don't know what to do yeah. about that. So it's you're a saying problem. reinvent it every. I have to do it all the time, but it's not that different from business, because any executive knows that he he just goes back in full circles and fix the same damn things that he fixed a year ago and he fixes it again. Your staff's yeah. like in the room listening. Yeah, they're awesome. They're <laughs> awesome. But you implement a system with any human beings, I don't care what it is, and you implement that system and everybody agrees to it and you come back six months later and you don't recognize it. That's just mm-hmm. the way human beings are. We just all kind of drift. Mm-hmm. We just kind of drift, you know? And that's So when you're, I, I haven't read this, we, we often in our home, we're we're discussing so when there, there's a problem, something's not working, something's breaking. We're always trying to figure out: is this the system or the person? Yeah, that's the great question. In the in, in the you know, is this so? Is it virtue or is it like order? You know. No, you're exactly right, and that's that's um <clears throat> probably the most important business lesson I ever learned. Really, is is that exact thing? Where do you point the finger? And what I mean by that is, when I really got into systems management, like really started studying different <clears throat> business efficiency philosophies and tools. I learned from like the manufacturing world, Lean Six Sigma, and these other kind of business philosophies. Now, when something goes wrong, the first place you should look is the system. How did the system fail us? When I was early, I thought the good CEO was always supposed to say it was me. Well, it is. It is. Let me tell you why, though. Because you can do, you can point the finger at the person and say he screwed up, or you point the finger at the system, and because I'm the keeper of the system, I'm pointing my finger at myself because I say my system failed this person Mm -hmm. that's what leadership really is is you first point it at the system so when you're at your home and you said it it, did the person mess up or was the an order or structure or a process messed up and when that process is met that's on you and your wife that's not your kids you're the guardian of the system right and so pointing at your finger say how did the system fail you you first do that after you've improve that and refine that and the person's still messing up then you point the finger at them mm. that's in that i mean you still get you still get to blame people at some point <laughs> but you're, you have to first it's funny i feel like most people like they couch uh <clears throat> you know that you're blaming and making it sound friendlier but like no there's times where it's actually your fault of course yeah. that's why you fire yeah. people yeah you're if right. you did not fi- if the world did not fire people we'd all be bankrupt all right so i'm gonna speaking of firing people i no, I you have can't a, find, you can't fire your kids. You no, cannot do that. That's, well, that's, or your that's wife. what I'm trying to word it is I hear people talk about why well, we need to make businesses like families. Mm. And part of me like vomits a little bit in my mouth because a businesses like families or families like business. Which one were you They saying? want to make businesses yeah, like families. I think that's, and I think, yeah, I think that's kind of silly. Well, I, the reason I obviously I have trouble with it, but I think in some instances it seems like the business itself becomes a community and a family. And it actually might be really good. Like, it's good for the people in that business. And because we live in a culture that has so little culture, community, bi- yeah. people are lonely. They do lack meaning. So they get it at work. Now, it's not – it's good to have meaning in, at work. Not, none of that is bad. But it actually becomes a replacement to where the work is cordoned off the, the company, the organization, whatever it is. And, like, that is – I mean, especially in the in the church world, when you when you mix in – like apostolic endeavors with like prayer and, and rules of life with your, even like people you're working with, uh, these, or the, it becomes a community where people aren't capable or they're not actually living <clears throat> like loving their neighbor and having community like, I don't know, in 
it's not integrated. Um, but also the thing that that bugs me is you can't fire your family. Exactly right. And that's why the church. Um, I, I read a fascinating. Uh, it was actually by an Anabaptist. But he was saying he thinks in America it's actually we're we're hyped up on discerning our gifts. Um, you know, there's analogies in in scripture for what the church is, mm-hmm. right? You know, the church is an organization. We know, you know, philosophically, the church is a, a perfect or as a society, right? Perfect society, um, all these things. But he, he says when we're discerning gifts, it's actually that's really hyper individualist. Like there is somewhere where I can serve. I need to discern my gifts and give it over. Whereas more common in scripture is that the church is a family and you need to put up with one another and you belong to one another and you're not getting out of this, Mm -hmm. that that's the attitude. So I guess my, my question is, yeah, you're, you seem to be scoffing a little bit at the idea that a business is a family. No, no, I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm saying, so for example, I'm not saying that you should treat a business like a family. I'm not, I'm saying you should treat your family a little bit more like a business. Okay. To me, there's a big difference there. So I'll explain. So, so, for example, I had this one lady that we kind of became business partners with a long time ago, creating a certain product. You know, we're recording this. Yeah, and she okay. will be named. She will be nameless, right? But the fact is, is she had been divorced m- multiple times, and she had made a good product. But when she was, we're basically um, putting the deal together. She's like, "We're going to make this work no matter what. This is like a marriage. We are sticking together through thick and thin." I'm like. No, it's not like a marriage, <laughs> and you don't have a good track record That's in that right. anyway. Yeah, why are you using so, that? So yeah, we are not comparing this to what I have at home. So no, it's a business arrangement. We have contracts, and there's ways in and out of those, and that's it. So uh, do we talk about the business family here? Yeah, but it's a very loose thing, and I think when you push that analogy too far. It's cheapening your family, and it's it's pretend because we all know, mm. you know. Hey, if this if imagine a imagine a wife who would leave her husband just because she can get ten thousand dollars more a year from this other guy down the street, right. and employees do that all the time, right. and that doesn't make it immoral. Right. So the analogy comes comes to a screeching halt, slams into a wall, and so I don't like talking about business like family. However, the whole point of well ordered family. Is that corporate America, Jason, has nice, been nice like, plug. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> corporate America has gotten really good at getting things done. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now they might do of evil things with that ability, but their ability to set a vision, mm-hmm. to align troops around that vision, to have bulletproof systems and awesome metrics of success and accomplish those goals. They're really good at that. Corporate right. America has perfected that. Families need to take some of those abilities and, like, apply it to the family life. So that's what I mean by a family can learn from business. We can bring a little bit of our business knowledge into family life and use some of those things. Because of the complexity of the world, we need to bring some business tools into family life. Right. So business helps family. I treat my family a little bit more like a business. I do not treat my business like my family. Right. Big difference. I I actually think... So in your defense, because, you know, here, this is a, you know, quasi agrarian, you know, homesteading show. Uh, I think what's fascinating about what you're saying is there's something of like, oh, that doesn't sound like what we're trying, like homesteaders. And like, that doesn't. But it actually, when I was doing the research for Leaders of the Land, there's my plug. Yeah. Um, uh, what was fascinating is the loss of the family as a working unit. Yes. Um was detrimental Absolutely. and we haven't recovered from it and they are the family and work is divided which is why we're talking about these i mean we're even talking about two separate things um so i definitely appreciate i hope we're not repeating this and was this in the last podcast it doesn't matter but when when you say i'm treating my family like a business i think some people go oh no the family is meant to be um an emotionally supportive conglomerate where you rest from things like business which is detrimental the two things that does is it makes everyone the, the purpose of the family is to support the individual in their pers- their pursuit of excellence and success which is not a family that's not a family right that's a that's a spa well i like see and go find any farm family or any small business family that that you know where the the family is producing their own well they're not getting in a car and driving to some other dude's office building right, right. 
the family operated. The children were like employees. I mean, if you're running a farm and your sustenance comes from that, or even if you're a dairy farm and you're producing milk and you're driving it somewhere to sell it, mm -hmm. that family is partaking in that. There is a business component. I mean, right. every farm family throughout history had to operate their family a little bit like a business. Mm -hmm. And that was, there's a, there's a lot of good things in that. In fact, that's been so separated because everybody gets in their car and drives to an office to where business and family is so separated, it's detrimental, like you're yeah. saying. So I think that there's any good farm is the is the easiest way to look at it. You can drive down the road and you'll see little farmhouses and they got the big silo and they got the tractors and the barrel of hay and all this. And I'm sitting there looking at it and saying, you know, the husband and wife and the kids, maybe there's an uncle, maybe there's, you know, son in laws. Their life rotates around that business, mm -hmm. and it's a family, and it's a business, and that's a beautiful thing. I think that's very natural. The unnatural thing is the complete divorce right. between those two. Yeah, so what you're, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying because it is true. I know that you know, my, my family, because we have a farm, not our full-time, we're, we're homesteading, but we do, we do have a commercial dairy, and we sell products. We do agritourism events, things like that, but uh, it absolutely shapes our life. We have to have a business meeting. Yeah. Every day because, yeah. I mean, that, that my son called. He said, well, we didn't feed hay because when we started the tractor, some kind of oil light came on, which I actually don't think is what happened. But, um, you know, so we're communicating based on what we have to do something together. Most households don't have – they don't do anything, and they don't, they don't do or make anything. So yeah. they're yeah. just there for one another. Now, yeah. they might have recreational things, but it seems that what the family tends towards is, one, is childish endeavors or – I mean, we can make it childlike, but you become dominant things like sports, da 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 da. Basically, stuff kids do. Yeah. Um, and then in recreation and play, not like like not the gravity of work, <clears throat> yeah. but also I think it completely uh, it makes it very difficult for a father to know what to do. I want you to be a good dad. Great. What do you want me to do? Which is which is funny because I picked up your book and I'm flipping through it and there's all these like agendas and to dos and stuff. Yeah. So I'm yeah. I'm imagining guys are liking this. In fact, I was going to ask you, um, you told me you spoke at a conference with college students yeah, and a ton of them came, like a thousand of them came to a talk on ordering your family. And these Dude, are, they don't have a family. Crazy. Were, was it mostly guys? No, it was, a, it was a good mix. So it was, the conference was SEEK, which is the Focus Missionaries kind of big annual conference. A lot of graduates, you know, people who are out of college who are former missionaries for Focus, they come, I think it's kind of like a reunion for the right. former missionaries, but it's mostly college kids with a, a good amount of young families. So I go into this big room where I was giving this talk, and I'm not kidding you, Jason. Like, I told my staff, I'm like, all right, I'm going to give this talk kind of practicing my whole spiel about this new business I'm starting, Well Order Family. Wellorderfamily.com. <laughs> well, did I say wellorderfamily.com? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say wellorderfamily.com. Uh, but uh, so I'm going to this room, and there's probably 500 people in it, and I'm 30 minutes before my talk, and I'm like, I'm in the wrong room. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was, I, I found the person who was in charge of all this. I'm like, I'm in the wrong room. I must be in like mm -hmm. Scott Hahn's room or something. Right. You know what I mean? It was, and he's like, no, this is your room. I'm like, why are they here? I thought mm -hmm. I was going to have 10 people. I yeah. really honestly. It wasn't false humility. I thought I had ten. I thought I was gonna have 10, 15 people, and then five hundred more people piled in. They had to close the doors. Like people were trying to get in from the outside because it was it was fire code issues. They couldn't. It was a madhouse. So I had over a thousand people, and I actually did that really stupid thing where you take your camera and you hold it up and you're like, hey. Oh no! I did that because you know I was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. But I thought I'd put you know, that on. I just cut the show. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, was like, I wanted to prove it to my wife because I didn't think she'd believe me. So, <laughs> no, okay, then so, that's a defense. And then the next time, I'm going to have everybody say, hi, Ashley. I'm going to start doing that, but everybody's <laughs> saying that? hi to my wife, yeah. Oh. So, but anyway. I which she is, likes that. Yeah, she probably will hate it. But anyway, what the hell was I talking about? Uh, what? All oh, these college students. So why are these people coming to this? And so, you know, the talk is about how to use business tools in your family life. And after it, I was like, why did you come? Why did you come? Why did you come? So young families with little kids, that's obvious. They, they're they pulling their hair out. I right. get that. We get that. But there was a lot of young couples who were dating, a lot of engaged couples. Hmm. And 
that I realized I need to make an engagement of this right away because these people are starting the whole pre-cana process and pre-cana is lame. Yeah, it just sucks. To can be we do frank. another? Yeah, we can do another show. It sucks. I'm a terrible. Story. And so, so here's here's the here's the idea that they get naturally they understand this. These young Catholic kids who want to get married, mm-hmm. they've already discerned they're not going to be a priest or whatever, and they want to get married. And they're studying business. A lot of these mm-hmm. kids were studying business or accounting or whatever. And so I start by saying, imagine a young man and a young woman graduate college, and they decide they're going to start a coffee shop together. It's their dream to have a coffee shop. Well, if they've heard of this thing called the Internet, then what they're going to do is they're going to search on the Internet. How do I start a small business? How do I be an entrepreneur? And they're going to get gobs of great resources on how to create a mission statement, how to choose your core values, what are the systems I need for like managing my inventory and making payroll, and what are the metrics I'm going to use for social media engagement? How many lattes do I sell versus decaf? You know, whatever, whatever. They're going to document these processes because they have to delegate to employees. They're going to do all of these things that every small business owner does because the resources on the internet today are incredible for Mm -hmm. this. And they're going to spend tens, uh, hundreds of hours, maybe maybe a thousand hours in preparation to really launch this. They're going to work really hard in in asking all of these questions. But here's where I get kind of pissed off, Jason. If that same young couple was getting married, they wouldn't spend one-tenth of the same energy mindset. They wouldn't ask one-tenth of those same kind of questions for their marriage, for mm-hmm. having a family. So why why are we putting so much more mental energy and precision of thought into something like running a business to make money than we are in the most important joint venture, most important partnership of your life, which is your marriage? Hold on. Let me argue with you then. All right. Because I would say family is so natural. Adam and Eve didn't have a, I think they probably looked at how the parts fit together pretty quick and, yep. you know, figured, but they still had to order, you know, so family is natural. Yes. What's, what seems to be the reason that we're not giving it that time or that we would actually need to give it the time is that we don't have the, the surrounding tradition, custom culture, that this is how you, that's why I tell my, my wife and I are discussing, you know, it's exhausting when you're making these constant decisions on like, should we do this or should we do that? We got invited to this or we didn't get invited to that or what, you know, it's like everything is our choice and we're making everything con- because we don't live in a traditional society. You're right. Um, so if we did live in that traditional society, if you we go, wouldn't be, we, we wouldn't, wouldn't be getting, all this we stuff. We wouldn't do business planning. We so would not. So maybe that the, 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 a world run by business, you're saying, okay, that is what our world is run by. It's run by business. So you need to give this sort of attention. And then the other side of that is that these college students, I, and I'm from my own experience, from a, a, all the experience of fr, fraternus, these, you know, St. Joe's Farm, fraternus.net. Fr, uh, <laughs> all of these things is that me, got young dads, yeah. m- most of us, and I, w- I bet actually at Seek, a lot of conversions, a lot of people that are maybe serious in the faith for the first time or yeah. had a conversion in college, like, I don't know how to do this <clears throat> based on the examples of what I saw unravel in my, my own home. So Dude, you've seen the, you've seen it? the stats on on drugs on or, you know, family moms and dads taking antidepressants, anti-anxiety pills like it's out of control. Twenty five percent of children, Jason, have clinically diagnosed uh, anxiety disorder, like to where they're not able to function like normal kids because they have so much anxiety. Hmm. That if we were all living on farms in 1800, you might be worried about what you're going to have for dinner sometimes. But mm-hmm. you're not you're not needing medication for anxiety. So how does so the attention you know that they gave the coffee shop? You're saying we need to be giving to ordering our family I, because I guess because of the environment we don't we're fish that don't know right. we're water. We're yeah. Stupid. So I think as corporate America has gotten more and more and more efficient, and it has, the family has gotten less and less and less efficient. It's like a direct anti-correlation, mm-hmm. you know, or whatever. You, mm-hmm. I mean, it's the direct inverse. You know, as as Apple Computer and Google have mastered the ability of like interrupting my day a thousand times with my damn iPhone, mm-hmm. and as Netflix and Amazon and cable and the news and the media have mastered the art of like screwing from my kids' brains, Mm -hmm. okay? And as society has been structured to where you have to get in the car to go do anything and everybody plays a thousand sports and everybody and moms have to do yoga class and all this garbage, everything has gotten so complex 
we need to actually use the same business concepts that businesses used to get really focused. So they used to say, Jason, in business, that the big eat the small, like big fish, Mm -hmm. little fish. Then they started saying, and I've said this for a long time, it's not the big that eat the small, it's the fast that eat the slow. But I think it's even changed now. I think it's the focused eat the unfocused. Wait, so, the fa- so the big eating the big was just power, that's monopoly, fast right. eating, that's innovation. <laughs> Correct. And then now it's the focused that eat the unfocused. I got to find some better way to say it because it doesn't no, sound I as get, good. Yeah, no, but I, the point is, is like there's so much stuff in our messed up world. There's so much stuff, stuff, stuff. Just look at anybody's garage. It's mm-hmm. ridiculous. There's so much stuff. And in the corporate world, because technology has kind of leveled the playing field, everybody can do everything. You can, yeah. Everybody can have social media. Everybody can have a website. Everybody can have an e-commerce site. Everybody can manufacture because there's white label companies that do everything. Right. Everybody can have a podcast. Every, everybody, <laughs> anybody can, anybody have can have a podcast, guarantee it. So everybody can do everything. So the people who are going to prevail are the ones who learn how to not do almost everything. Mm -hmm. They perfect the art of something very, very specific. I think families are strung out because they're trying to do everything. Mm -hmm. And they need to figure out my family, the Gallagher family, exists for the purpose of ABC. And the way we're going to accomplish ABC is one, two, three. These specific goals, and we're going to reiterate that time and time again. Because if we're not rigorous in our in our focus in our boiling down our purpose and our objectives and our goals if we're not rigorous with that the world pulls us away mm-hmm. and you've talked about yeah. that the world is pulling people away from the home they're pulling teenagers away from mom and dad they're pulling little kids away from each other right. it's the world is like a magnet just pulling us out and so we have to be rigorous in our focus. And I think that, so is these, that the first, these tools. Is, this, is that step help one? That. Is that step one? Is that what you gave the college students? Is that the, on this book? Is so what, what are you about? You I know? think that I've created a six part system vision, unity, systems, metrics, relationships, and discernment. My you, little, you couldn't my, get that into like my, three? My little, my little pie chart, okay? Let me see. Let me see. And so the, the idea is first vision, you got to figure out where you're going. Unity is, look, one percent of success in business jason is having a vision 99 percent of success is alignment or unity around that vision 87 percent of that statistic is something okay so 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 you have to have like this incredible alignment that's unity and that's family meetings and then you have systems and metrics and you have relationships in the sermon the only problem with family is is the is the the family member like that's the hardest part so right you always are going to have family dynamics you have the greatest systems the greatest vision the greatest family meetings blah 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 you're still gonna have conflict with your spouse well i'm I'm sitting here thinking about uh well the spouse you're not getting rid of but i'm thinking of families that uh as you know say an older teenage boy starts to be like a major problem in the family it makes me think of and you made me think of a you know a monastery Monastery has to have unity. I mean, yes. we, we are we are walking in a unified vision towards God. Yes. And if anyone disrupts that, then you have to leave. I mean, that unity that would be serious. I mean, that would be the the place where it seems what most families are doing is trying is not to have a unified vision because that's restraining to my liberty and exactly. my exactly um, that's that's restrictive to my person and you're not letting me flourish and you're you're controlling me. Yeah. Um, so, so are actually, you finding I, that families? are able to, like, that that unity idea? Because that sounds good, but I actually think that would be the one that's going to grate the most. It's hard. It's hard. So I got an example. So first of all, I called it well-ordered family order, religious order. You see, mm-hmm. you just referred to an order. What, why do they call them religious orders? Why don't they just call them religious communities? Well, it's mm-hmm. because they have a rule of life. They have an, they have an order mm-hmm. to their whole this is day. This how we do it. Yeah. And, and by the way, the land naturally produces that. Mm-hmm. Like you talk about laws and vespers, like you got to milk the cow, you mm-hmm. know, at yeah. certain times. Like she tells you that. You don't get to choose that, you know. And so the, the nature enforces a certain structure. But when you live in a concrete jungle with electricity, your, your days and nights don't matter anymore. And yeah. so it's messed up. I don't up. even know what time of day it is. Right. Yeah. 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 So, but... Um, I've had when we have family meetings. There's been twice. There's two. There's two examples when I had to kick out fire my teenage sons, or uh, one of them, different sons at different times. One and another one. And so, like the first time, this was a number of years ago when we had my first kind of sit down annual strategic planning session, and my son was 18 at the time, maybe 17. 
And he just had a sour attitude. It was mm-hmm. just like he was just flopping down on the couch, didn't really want to. He was just, you know, making it very obvious that he thought this was lame and stupid. He didn't want to have this meeting and didn't want to talk about visions and core virtues and things like that. And so I tried in the meeting to like, kind of like, you know, poke him and get him to shape up, and he wouldn't. So I kicked him out. Yeah. I said, you're out. Yeah. You know? Now, guess what? That guy is married. And by the way, his he got married a couple months ago, and his wife is now pregnant with All right. my second grandbaby on the way. I got two grandbabies on the way. I don't think I've told no. you that. And my daughter's pregnant, and my daughter-in-law is pregnant. I did think you looked older. And my yeah. wife is pregnant. And we got three babies coming like right at the same time, uh, right around the same time. Isn't that crazy, dude? Uh, so yeah, that's what this gray is right here. Yeah. But but now, my son goes on his honeymoon, and the very meeting that he got kicked out of a number of years ago, he said, "Dad, I'm going to have that meeting with my new wife on our honeymoon. We're going to yeah. set our vision statement. We're going to pick a family motto. We're going to pick a family patron saint. We're going to pick long term goals for our family." I'm like. That's a great way. To, there's other things to do on your honeymoon. Yeah. But after that, it's great to have these meetings and talk about this with your spouse. Like what? Like uh, going to dinner. Hold on. That's quick all I quick story. Sorry. Dinner. So that's all I on, meant. On our honeymoon, that's not what I meant. On our honeymoon, <laughs> we went to Rome, and I, I'm the little bit of English, I, or Italian, I'm talking to this guy. I'm like, hey, we're on our honeymoon, so if you have like a special room, you know, right, right outside the Vatican. We're new Catholics. We just converted. And he said, oh, yeah, I've got a, I got a great room. And... uh so we walk in, it's, you know, it's tiny because in Europe, all the rooms are tiny and it's leopard print all over the walls <laughs> and like a zebra back on the awesome. bed. So, all right. Anyway, so your son, I, that's actually what I thought of is if someone's going to try to do this. So the analogy is in, in homesteading, as I've learned, people are like, oh, I want to move to the land. I'm like, oh, yeah, well, here's how we did it. And something I'm realizing is that my children were young enough that they were brought up in it. Yeah. And I've seen a number of people where they're like, oh, we're going to move to the land. We're going to, and then. But you've got a kid who's a complete suburbanite, yeah, and he it's it's grading on everything he has already become. Yes. Yes. So your teenager, like it, you haven't been doing this, it's right. going to be harder if you're twenty years in, yeah, or t- 10, 15 years in, yeah. Um, though some sometimes, and I, it it really, uh, especially teenage boys, are super irritating to men yes. who are trying to bring order to something because they're being chi- they're they're acting like a selfish toddler. My my hack to that. Though, and I've learned, and I've violated my own rule that I tell people to. I, you know, I'm a hypocrite. I tell people what to do, and then I don't do it very well. Because I had this problem the other day. I had my other 18 year old. Oh, is this the second firing? This is the second firing. Okay. And this kid's an awesome kid. Like anybody who knows, he's not a kid, he's an 18 year old yeah. young man. But I kind of kicked him out, you know, because he just had this sour attitude for this particular meeting. He's not going to listen to this. He'd be embarrassed if he knew I said it. But I don't want him to listen to so, but. You know, I kicked him out. Well, why? I was reflecting on it afterwards. Well, I write in the book and I tell people in my talks, there are tips. There's like a whole page in that book on tips to engage your teenagers, okay? Mm-hmm. What you need to do, you know this from fraternus and just being a human, that the problem with teenagers is they are stuck between adolescent and adulthood. They feel that friction even more than we see it. And our modern world has allowed this like perpetual adolescence, even to where you go to a party for four years and do a little bit of school. It's called mm-hmm. college. Yeah. And it's like there's just no work, there's no responsibility. Now, kids in larger families, I think, like I think they're they are kind of thrust into they're like mid level management. They have to <laughs> yeah. do things. Yeah. And if you grow up on a farm, again, it's more work. So mm-hmm. you don't you don't get to diss the cow or the chickens right. or the chores because you want to play video games. Like you have to do things. So but the way to avoid having to fire your, your teenagers out of these meetings is to sit down with them well in advance, like the, a day or two before, and say, listen, son, I'm trying to have this meeting. You're one of the older kids. you got younger siblings. They're looking at you. I need your input on multiple levels. Number one, you've been around this family and seen our dysfunction for 18 years, and I want your input. I genuinely value it. Number two, I need you to be a good example so that the 15 and 14 and 10-year-old or whatever – See a good example. I need you to help me do this. So I want you to think about the following three questions. What should our core values be going forward? Or should we switch our patron saint? Or do we need to pick different quarterly you fired goals? fire a saint too? Right. Oh, yeah. I, sw- I fire saints all the time. It's awesome. I actually think you should have a different saint every year because it gives you an opportunity to develop another relationship. They don't mind. And then you can put up all, <laughs> all the saints on the wall like you have like the wall of fame with your saints. Right. But anyway, that's another story. But ask them, and then here's the thing. 
In business, there's a big mistake, Jason. Like the boss thinks he's supposed to run the meetings. That's a big mistake. Mm -hmm. The boss should not, the person in charge of the substance should not be in charge of the procedure. So in law, there's like substantive law and procedural law. So I never run a meeting anymore, okay? Somebody else has to run it. And the and the the more diversity you can have in like running the meeting, we call it being the scribe, okay? Or being the chairman or whatever you want to call it. Ask your teenager to do it. If you have these agendas, which I put in the book, ask that 16-year-old with a bad attitude, we'd like you to chair this meeting. Prep them, you know, prepare them. But get their adult involvement. That's a huge path. Yeah, treat to, them like to, an adult. Yes. That's why I think when you're firing an 18-year-old or he's out, I mean, the, the two reasons is that if he's acting like a child or he's ready to be a man. Exactly. I mean, cause in which case, you wouldn't be kicking him out. Well, and that's what Fraternus is all about, is yeah. like you're trying to get these young men to associate on an adult level with adult men. Yeah. And that's why, like, you can't stand it when people think of it as just a youth group. Yeah. It's, it's not very, that. Yeah, it's very difficult. I mean, but, but it, we've, the, the church has, uh, I don't know if you get Sword and Spade magazine. I do. You should, uh, the, the article on kid Catholics, I think one of the reasons um, th that I would propose that we e even have is this youth thing is that youth culture is an economic reality. Yeah, it is. Because it's when, it's, because boys used to become men. That was, there was one step. Boy, you can tell, like, man. in their clothes and old pictures. Boys became men. When they were capable of, be, of being men, and they and basically when they became producers, because a child is by necessity a consumer, they consume without giving anything back. When the home became a place of pure consumption, right? Dad goes off and makes money, and then we come home and we spend it. That's how, that's what a home is for. It wasn't then the, the sons particularly didn't have something to do. They weren't producers, and then we created youth culture, which is why there's no. I mean, you know, like in, in the nineteen uh, twenties, thirties, forties. Even up to the 40s, record companies sold records so that families could listen to it and go, oh, yeah, we want to play that as a I know. family. I was about to ask you. I have a question. Okay. Did Elvis create youth culture? Yeah. Well, they say that was the the, the ceiling of it, that yeah. somewhere between um, Elvis shaking his hips and Woods. Well, actually, so Elvis shaking his hips yeah. uh, on TV, that is when uh, the somebody, somebody put it like that's when the innocents died in America. Yeah. yeah. And then Woodstock is when the youth took over the governance of our, <laughs> yeah, which is why now, I mean, we're both wearing jackets here because we're such gentlemen, but it would, and, and now, so think about how you can tell a music station from a fifties music, sixties music, seventies music, eighties music, even nineties music. But at this point it's all leveled out. It's just this, this kind of same thing yeah. from general. I mean, I guarantee you 2024, 2034, the music and everything we've, we've even leveled out our clothing where everyone's dressing, you know, like dad in his under armor polo, that you know, son in his Under Armour T-shirt, right, 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 and like, <laughs> yeah, I've also, you know, how many times have you seen like old black and white pictures, and you, I think the kid is like eighteen years old, and he's like thirteen, mm -hmm. and it's because he parted his hair, and yeah. he had a nice jacket on, yeah, and he just dressed like an adult, and so yeah, I've often thought about that somewhere along the line of the fifties, maybe. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the ascent, so the ascension adolescent culture began. Well, you can look up if anybody's interested. Kid Catholics is the article uh, that was in Sword and Spade, and it. In that, I wanted I followed the rise of youth culture as a consumerist. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then it became when the '80s and the '90s. This is a whole other podcast. We should have started over. Uh, right. '80s and the '90s is when you have the you know the the boomers take over control right in the '80s and the '90s. And this is when the rise of self esteem. 1970. And you can look on Google. You can look at word searches like oh yeah how, when that. when. In, in books, so how often words like self esteem were used oh, yeah. in the '60s didn't exist. Yeah. By the '80s and '90s, everyone is obsessed with it because we become this consumer, self absorbed culture, uh, and it's not working because now our kids are really miserable. the The key is not to make them feel more special; it's actually to ha help them do things, yeah. like do something and be productive. They want to; they don't want to be passive. But uh, won't the pendulum swing back? I mean, even we're talking about clothes. Jordan Peterson, I feel like he re reintroduced the three piece suit. You know, I mean, it's like yeah. you know, and so there's a lot of people. Like you can look on Fox News Sunday or something, or not that, not not the word. What was the the TV channel? I watch football on Sundays, and it's like Fox Sports, yeah, Fox yeah. Sports or whatever. Every one of those guys ten years ago was like casual, and mm -hmm. now they're all in three piece suits. Now hmm. they got weird looking shoes because they have these like tennis shoe dress shoes things. Right. It's kind of weird to me. But they're all <laughs> in three piece suits. It's the new thing. It's like coming back, which I think is great. Yeah. And I th I think men are starting to say, "How do I look gentlemanly again?" Right. And I even heard I was at this you know very secular business convention up in Chicago not long ago, 
And I, somehow I was hearing these these women in my group were talking, and they made the comment, the feminist movement uh, have uh, forced men to act like women, mm-hmm. and now we're angry at them for not acting like men. Mm-hmm. And so, so I, I think the pendulum is going to start swinging back, and I think men are kind of reclaiming their place in family and society and the way they dress and gentlemen. Yeah, I hope that's There's a true. lot of good things. I mean, Look, the, at beards came back. Beards are yeah. Someone said you know, someone too many. Me, too many beards. Too I know. long. You know. Somebody, but, some, somebody was like, "Why is like every millennial Catholic podcaster? Why do they always have to have a beard?" Yeah, I, know. I don't yeah. know. Because yeah, I lost my razor. Well, it. well, it's like that's the thing is it's it's they're they're scraping to find manliness. Yeah, they always right, so have that, to have their pipe, and it just it, they overdo yes, it. Sometimes, I was going to say, yeah, but, the, you know, the, the, okay. everyone brews beer. I'm kind of tired of it. You know, yeah. what I mean? <laughs> but it's like they're they're trying to grasp. They're trying to right. find these manly things, which is good. Right, but I, it's I think the parts the it's a where, little artificial. Well, sometimes. when it gets costumey, uh, is when you're getting your accoutrement in your taste from the internet. Yeah. In which case, it's just another consumer brand. Yeah. The much better thing is to understand what the basic decorum of your place is. Now, if you don't have a place, but, you know, the, it's actually easier for men. It's like, you know what? You need to put a jacket on, and you need to learn how to wear a tie. And, right. I mean, and you start at mass. I mean, start at give your yeah. best to God. Start, yeah. start at mass. And then, you know, in our family, we're on the phone. We're like savages. I mean, when we're around there, it's – but actually, my, my, one of my mentors, he's a farmer, all my kids are out there barefooted, right? And he grew up on a farm. And, and um, I said, oh, you know, like you, my kids aren't wearing shoes. He said, my dad would whip my butt if I went outside without shoes and socks on. Wow. And, uh, I mean, just, you know, this was way back in the day, way backwoods. He said, no. And, and you see pictures of them, and they, you know, they were they dressed decent. So we try, you know, if we're, if we're going into town, you know, put your clothes on. The biggest <laughs> problem is uh, you put some clothes on. We have, this, we have this one son. I won't name him in case he ever listens, but he – uh we know if it's cold outside because he's wearing jeans instead of shorts, and that because we make our kids do their laundry. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, "Oh, I got a hack. Just wear shorts, and that's it." He went right. shirtless from like all summer, and then now it's winter time, and he's like, "If it's above forty, he's not wearing a shirt." He, look, he looks like the he looks like Tarzan, like surrounded by the apes, you know, with a little, <laughs> little loincloth on. So if I go by the Jason Craig farm, do I see like little Tarzans out there? <laughs> well, there no because one I got like one son who's always shirt tucked in, boots on, like hat, and then this other one. And the reason is people give us clothes because they feel sorry for us. <laughs> and they give me all these these dang athleisure clothes. Oh, yeah. Like this athleisure is the thing, right? Like that's the base like a golfer. So are you sick of yoga pants? <laughs> Can we do a whole season all right. on my frustration with yoga pants? Or I, I want to do one. The con the, the sign of the conflict of our culture right now, especially like in, you know, rad trad movements and stuff is or in college campuses, it's like we, we live in a time where someone can be wearing a chapel veil and yoga pants at the same time. <laughs> Like, that's true. how you know we don't know. know what we're doing. I know we don't. Yeah, we're like a schizophrenic world. Okay, yeah. so I want I want to wrap up because this is going. Everywhere. I have a really important question for you, though. Remember, um, I was told you there's. All right, I, 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 yes. Don't wrap up before I do that. Okay. The well, what I want to come back to, I'd like to do another podcast, and I'm gonna go ahead and say what it is with you is the unity and having the family meeting, mm-hmm. um, because that is something that thanks to my wife and actually some of her homeschool. Um, philosophies and then my own nature of enjoying substantial conversation instead of chit chat or what are you going to buy next week right um is um we have conversations as a family that have substance and meaning and we've actually started more and more to do when because when cultures used to be adult cultures the children didn't speak at the table Mm-hmm. So we've more and more made our table a place of adult conversation and, and shut the kids well, up. They learn a lot by listening. Yeah. Well, yeah, I wish yeah. They, they would learn more. Um, so I want to talk about having the family meeting and having those conversations yeah. and whether or not they're, how, how those, you know, structure and organics. But we'll do that next time. What's your weird question? So whenever I see uh, a, uh, a, a billionaire – Entrepreneur, I think of Jason Craig, right? So I was seeing, I was seeing, right? Of course, I mean, doesn't isn't that what everybody thinks? Uh, so I saw Elon Musk, okay, on Joe Rogan's podcast, and I, I had this vision that that Elon Musk calls Jason Craig, and again, I, that sounds like a joke, like Elon Musk and Jason Craig walk into a bar, but Elon Musk calls Jason Craig and says, "Hey, you remind me of Noah, okay, and you look like him a little bit." And a young Noah. 
And so I'm building an ark to fly to Mars, and we're going to colonize <laughs> Mars. But the ship isn't that big, so we can't take two of every kind. Mm-hmm. We can only take 10 animals. And from that 10 animals, we have to populate the, the Mars. What 10 animals do you take? <laughs> Wait, is this? If Elon Musk called me and he said, hello, this is Elon Musk, I would say, who? <laughs> um, Very rich man. Wait, um, so you're asking me that question? Yeah. So, like, what 10 animals would you take? I had fun thinking okay. about this, right? Because, I, would, I mean, I would. Uh, you know, do you take do you take a bull and, like, four cows? Or do you take, well, but like, there's all no, goats? Or do you take some fish? Or I don't want to geek, geek out on this because I'm thinking, well, there's nothing on Mars to eat. So what can I? You got to take the stuff. animals. You gotta, well, all right. So well, presuming right. the animals That's, have something to eat. Of course. Okay. Um, Somebody else brought all the absolutely, plants. Absolutely, absolutely would bring a milk cow. Milk cows. Because you get manure for the soil. You get milk. You get to eat their babies for beef. And it's, there's a reason. And you would hopefully have a bull. And a bull. That's you, the backbone. Or a bunch of frozen semen, which is the church allows artificial insemination. Right. Okay. In case anyone's <laughs> taking notes. Right. And it, that's not even in the 10 animals. That's just like another container. Yeah, that's so right. So I don't Musk, need a bull. We just no need, bull. No we bull. need a whole container of frozen semen. Yeah, one of them will be a bull in the future. <laughs> He'll know, he's, probably okay. got, he's probably got spares. Okay. Um, awesome. I mean, pigs. Pigs would be next. Rabbits. I thought about that. I heard that they can produce 200 pounds of yeah. meat a year. Yeah, it's in, it's in the book. We, we, we go through all those. Yeah, you just read the book. It's oh, in there. All right. Um, would you take fish? There's water there? Yes, yeah, of I course. Take there's there's water. Think. Somebody else brought water of like to I'm, Mars. Like I'm an idiot for not thinking about it. Uh, fish. Where are we? Cows, pigs, fish, chickens. These are all relatively disease free. Rabbits. That's five. I'm good. So you just, okay, so two, yeah, two of each. That's right. One cow, one bull. No bull. What? The frozen bull. Frozen oh, the, oh, that's right. You got yeah, frozen, frozen semen. semen. I forgot about it. We need that. a pack of gloves. Gloves and. A pack of gloves to, for, to get the semen in there. It doesn't without the bull takes. How do you work. do that, Jason? There's a, it involves a straw, a long glove, and a lubricant. All right. Is that a homeschool lesson? <laughs> they see it all the time. They're watching. There. Yeah. Uh, what I've about had goats? The, Isn't goat meat the most edible meat like in the world? Yeah. Uh, uh, they say it's the most eaten. eaten I guess. Yeah. Uh, people say you find out when you're homesteading if you're a goat person or a cow person. I'm just not a goat person. Right. But yeah, okay. You bring some goats. That'll be the all right. the bonus, and if they die, whatever. You all right. Die. Well, maybe Elon will listen to this and all right. Give uh, a call. Connor, thank you for being on uh, on Till and Keep podcast. Next time, we're going to talk about the the family unity and uh, and having these meetings and conversations a little more specific. Because uh, I after this podcast, I don't think you'd be good at that. So okay. I'm interested how you wrote it down. All right. Thanks for being here. Thanks, man. <laughs> this episode of Till and Keep has been brought to you by Tan Fraternus and Sword and Spade. Till and Keep is a podcast that shows how the primordial command from God to Adam to till and keep the garden applies whether you toil on a farm or in a concrete jungle. Visit tillandkeeppodcast.com to subscribe and follow the show. And use coupon code TILL25 to get 25% off your next order at tanbooks.com.